Okay. It's Cheryl Grant, Director of Social Networking for the Haystack MacArthur Foundation Digital Media and Learning Competition. We're back to start our webinar. Uh, just so everyone knows, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, Haystack administers the competition. We are partnered with the Mozilla Foundation in the Badges for Lifelong Learning competition. And we are fortunate today to have Aaron Knight, Assessment and Badge Project Lead for Open Badges at the Mozilla Foundation join us. She's going to walk us through some slides to talk about design and prep, badge systems, models, and, and design. And we may also have David Theo Goldberg, who's the Executive Director of the Digital Media and Learning Research Hub, join us. His schedule has been a little bit in flux, so if he does join us, we'll, we'll announce that and let everybody know, and, and he'll be able to answer some questions as well. So once we're done with Aaron's slides, we'll go to a Q&A. I'll be moderating the questions, and um, anyone who wants to ask them, you can do that in two different ways. You can participate through Twitter using the hashtag DML badges, or if you're participating and able to see on your screen, you can do so uh, submit questions through the chat box. We'll be archiving the webinar where we have all of our other ones on the dmlcompetition.net blog. So if you go to dmlcompetition.net, you should see a link to the blog, and that's where we'll be putting the archive up if, if you want to run through this again with anyone who's on your team or just to, to catch up and, and, and uh, check your notes. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce Aaron. Um, one thing I did want to say before we do that is we want to make sure everyone receives fair treatment. So it's a, it's a good thing for us to make sure that we don't give feedback on your specific proposal, but any general questions, we're more than happy to address those. So feel free to submit your questions. And I'm going to go ahead and introduce Aaron and, and hand it over to you there. Are you there, Aaron? Yes, hello, everyone. <clears throat> so let me show my screen. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, I see my screen and my cute baby Jackson. Um, so I think last time I did this, I uh, um, tried to do full screen mode and uh, no one could really see my slides, so we're going to do kind of a, a sort of um, makeshift one here where I sort of fill my screen. So um, let me know if, if people can't see my slides, but, um, but basically, uh, yes, so I'm here today to talk about um, some ideas and principles and suggestions behind um, badge system design and sort of thinking um, as people are sort of prepping for, for stage two. Um, one thing to really note with all of this is, um, is you know, this as Cheryl has mentioned, as as a lot of the DML competition materials have mentioned, um, this is a, is sort of kind of an experiment or a, a venture that we're all taking under together and sort of building this ecosystem together. So, so a lot of the um, a lot of the ideas and best practices are are kind of you know coming at a very nascent point in in the process, and so so they're they're meant to really be built on and um, and sort of evolve together as we go through. But but there are some some sort of kind of clear um, uh, things that we can talk about at this point. So um, again, stage two is about badge system proposals, and and that. Um, that's an important distinction, uh, which I'll, I'll explain a little bit more, but um, the badge systems are aligned with content from stage one. So the stage one winners have been announced. So either content from those winners or the collaborator content, which includes um, content like from NASA and um, uh, Department of um, uh, Education, et cetera. Um, or there is also the option that you can, um, if you have ideas around a badge system or around various technologies for supporting badge systems, um, you can actually can submit that, that um, unaligned with winning content. So you can use your own content or fic like fictitious content to demonstrate that idea. But the idea is that if, if you are a winning stage two proposal, you will be matched with content from, from stage one. So all of the badge systems that ultimately get um, created at the end uh, will be using the content from from stage one or the collaborator content. Um, so the badge system distinction is important because um, we're really talking about more than just um, an image, right? So so we would not really um, expect a proposal that just said, oh, here's here's a badge. I gave it a title and I designed an image for you um, to really uh, move on from stage two because we're talking about here. We're talking about the system underneath the badges. So that's that's criteria and assessments behind the badges, um, any kind of supporting systems like 
um, you know, sort of maybe learning environments or various technologies, um, various interaction types of systems. Um, so that that's ultimately that's what's going to get built on the other end. And so, so when, in these proposals, we we want to see um, sort of thinking on that level. And so, obviously, there's going to be um, sort of a variety or a continuum of of sort of um, requirements or, or needs for these proposals because some content is actually pretty far along. So there is some content that already has assessments, already has a lot of that there, and so the badge system design is, is just going to build on top of that. Whereas there's some content um, that, that has one or collaborative content that, that is pretty much pretty bare in, in, in the sort of criteria assessment level. It's more about um, you know, here are some skills that we teach and, and it, it's really going to require a lot more thinking around around the, um, the, the sort of underlying meat behind the badges. Um, same with the technologies in the system. So, so that, will, that will differ based on the content that you picked, but, but there should be some kind of consideration and, and, and thinking around the, the bigger system, not just the, the, the badges themselves. And we'll talk more about that. Um, before going into that, though, I, I did want to just briefly talk about the Mozilla Open Badge Infrastructure because um, all of the badge systems that, that ultimately get developed from this competition will plug into the Mozilla Open Badge infrastructure, um, and there are elements of that that sort of help um, help you think about and, and define some of the badge system that, that you're working on, and so, so it's worth sort of mentioning now. I'm, I'm just going to do kind of a brief intro so um, I, can, uh, we, I can point you to, to sort of more technical information, but, but basically the idea behind the Mozilla Open Badge infrastructure is that um, we could all go off and build badge systems um, and while those would be probably fairly valuable within our, our environments or within our, our very kind of um, smaller communities or learning uh, situations, uh, what we really want, want to do here is create this ecosystem. We really want to put the learner at the center and let learners earn badges um, across multiple issuers, across multiple learning providers, and pull all of those badges into a single collection that then they totally own. So a, a living transcript, if you will, that, that they can grow based on their experiences wherever they have them, and then they can decide how to share that, that, that those badges out. So in order to do that, we, we need this, we need an infrastructure, an underlying sort of plumbing, if you will, that, that helps tie all of those um, disparate badge systems together so that so, so that um, the, the badges can again be collected and then shared out. So that's that's what the infrastructure that Mozilla is building is for. It really, um, it, it, we're trying to do it as simplistic and as streamlined as possible. So it's really just a, um, a specification for what information should be included with badges, as well as um, a set of repositories for, for learners to collect their badges in. Um, again, all of the systems developed through the competition will plug into the Open Badge infrastructure, and that basically means your badges will get pushed into the infrastructure. So anytime someone earns that, a badge, um, it would be pushed into the infrastructure and, and into their collections there. And so your systems must be interoperable um, with, with the OBI. So um, you don't need to really know what that means on a super technical level for the proposals. Um, you do need to kind of think about like what badges are you pushing to the OBI and, and just sort of you know, at least acknowledge that, that consideration. But we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, in terms of interoperability, again, this is really when it comes down to it is, is a pretty simple um, specification that we've defined around badges. And so the idea is um, to be interoperable, your badges have to um, have to sort of match that that um, specification. So, really, the specification is a set of metadata that that needs to be included with each badge. And the benefit of that is that then, as a badge is um, is shared across the ecosystem, it carries with it all the information that you need to you need to have to understand that badge and to understand its value. So, so this is a little snippet of a code of the code behind the badge. Again, you don't really need to know this right now, um, but, uh, um, but the idea is that, you know, it includes the, um, the issuer, the, the name of the badge, the, if there's an expiration date, the criteria behind the badge, um, and so these are all things that as you're thinking about um, each badge, you, should, you, should, you all need to kind of think, think, think through, um, and some of it is pretty straightforward, like who is the issuer, but, um, but again, that's, um, that's kind of the open badge infrastructure piece. Um, we can point you to more information there, and, and I'll sort of allude back to it as, as I go through these slides as well. Um, before going into some of the, the specifics around the um, RFP, or the call for proposals, um, we wanted to just briefly talk about a few badge system models. Um, these are 
sort of high level approaches to badge systems that, that already exist out there. Um, and they might be helpful for just kind of thinking about um, sort of maybe a starting point for the types of, of badge systems that you, that you want to create or, or at least having some examples to, to go back to. Um, one thing to note is I actually don't really believe that these, these are, there's a strong delineation between these types of models. Um, I, as I'll talk about as I go through them, I think that, that there's actually a lot of examples that have little pieces of each. Um, and so, so don't feel like you have to kind of fit within any um, type of bucket with this or, or that this is, these are the three that you have to pick from. These are just um, simply uh, examples to kind of help you think through things. But the first is a training, training and leveling systems. Um, and so these are um, typically skill-based um, with, with kind of a, uh, an assessment um, behind each skill. So you, um, you sort of, you demonstrate a skill and you earn a badge for, for that type of skill. Um, and typically they're leveled. There's kind of some trajectory or um, sort of pathway that, that you're working towards. Maybe you move from basic to expert. Um, uh, and also they typically expire. Um, a lot of these badges will be something that you need to sort of refresh um, or kind of stay up on. Um, so examples are uh, first aid training and, and scuba diving, diving cert certification, which really aren't um, digital badge systems, obviously, but, but you can see the kind of connection between the two. Um, and then uh, the P2PU School of Webcraft badge pilot, which I'm actually going to walk through in detail at the end because we were involved in designing that. Um, that also is a training leveling system where there are web development skills that um, you can earn badges for and sort of um, move, up, move through um, various levels. Um, and then also Khan Academy, um, which many of you may know, it. They, they have levels in their badges as well that are tied to very specific math and science skills. Um, another model is dynamic dossier, which is um, less about kind of discrete skills and more about kind of um, ongoing performance. So ongoing um, uh, interaction with sites, um, sort of performance within various sites or in various challenges. I um, mean, you kind of earn points and move up. Um, it within the, the community or, um, uh, or the site itself. And, and so these are typically um, very computational based, very data, data rich, so that um, again, it's, it's tracking your every movement and sort of leveling you up based on, um, based on that uh, performance. There's often rich visualization. So this right here is a screenshot of sort of a dashboard for one of the, um, user, uh, one of the users in Top Coder, which is an example here. Um, but again, so the, the badges might um, the, the badges you might get might be for various levels or for various achievements, but not typically as, as sort of skill based um, or very specific skills as the training and leveling model. Um, the other uh, another model is this is social systems. So these are um, more about kind of social interaction or um, uh, Kind of more participation within within various websites, um, community interaction. Then again, then sort of more performance based. Um, the the focus is kind of peer co connection or reputation, um, and uh, more of the sort of softer side of things, I guess, um, than than kind of the harder skills. An example here is Stack Overflow, and you might have seen that I actually put Stack Overflow as an example on the dossier systems. So again, I think that there's crossover. Um, between the ways that um, that systems are developed, and and as we'll talk about, I think there's actually value in in having um, you know sort of little pieces of each, or having some social system type of badges um, along with skill badges to sort of round out the types of um, um, recognition that people can get on your on your website or in your system. So those are three models. Again, um, those are up on the DML competition website. You can go back and sort of reference them. Um, again, they're just meant to be kind of kind of uh, examples to kickstart ideas in your mind. You don't uh, need to feel confined to, to those examples. Um, in fact, we'd love to see new models that, that are um, created through these proposals. But um, what we want to do is uh, walk, so the, the um, stage two RFP or the call for proposals on the website has a list of basically badge system characteristics. And, um, and the idea is to sort of, is in your proposal for you to sort of address a lot of those. So none of them are required. Um, in fact, there might be some proposals that don't specifically um, address, um, you know, every, certainly everyone, but maybe even a big chunk. But the idea is that these are important things to think about um, to really kind of thoroughly think through your badge system. So, um, so you can choose to kind of include um, whatever you want in your proposal, but 
But again, as you're planning the badge system, you should sort of work through these to make sure you at least have some idea or at least kind of consciously deciding um, uh, one way or the other for each of these characteristics. So what I want to do today is to go through some of those and just kind of briefly talk about them, give you some examples or suggestions on each. Um, and then after I get through those, we'll walk through the P2P U badge system um, with those characteristics in mind so I can sort of show you our thinking um, for each excuse me, for each one of those. So the first one is, um, our first few are content and skills. So this is kind of the most no-brainer um, of badge system design, uh, given that, of course, any badge system needs to have badges. Um, and those badges obviously need to represent something. So um, I think every proposal will probably, uh, yes, will absolutely reference um, this, these characteristics. So what is the domain you're working in? Like what types of skills? What discipline? Um, what are the badges themselves? What are you calling them? Um, you know, what do they represent? What skills are covered? Um, again, I think a, um, a, a good kind of suggestion or, or point here is, is to be mindful or to consider both hard and soft skills when you're thinking through this. So it's not just about you know, learning JavaScript or, or learning um, you know, addition or subtraction. There's, um, those are certainly very important and there should maybe be badges around those, but then also like what are the, some of the, the softer skills or the social interactions that are occurring that are also important, like collaboration or teamwork or, or things that, that um, the people also could be learning on your, through your badge system and should be recognized. Um, are these skills discrete or continuous? So again, going back to the training leveling model versus the dossier system, you know, are you actually going to give um, a badge for a skill, or is it going to be something about um, a badge for a level or a or a ver like a or a various role or um, um, opportunity? Um, the next characteristics are uh, scar scarcity and granularity. So we have. Um, sort of an opportunity with badges to, um, to actually capture a much more granular set of skills and um, achievements than, than, than we really see right now in any kind of credentialing or accreditation system. So um, a lot of our sort of end marks or records right now are pretty abstracted away from, from the learning um, that has occurred. So you might get a degree, but you don't necessarily see the various skills that, um, that you have uh, that you've learned along the way, or even just a grade in a class, like there's various things that sort of went into that, that that sort of get lost, if you will, with that final grade. And so, so we have that opportunity with badges to to you know badge things along the way, and to, and those badges live on, so you can see that you've developed um, you know A through Z skills um, in order to get to a certain level. Um, the it is a, a trade-off, of course, because um, you know we could get very very granular and and badge everything and. And, and then it gets kind of messy. So, it, so there is kind of, and, and there's no, you know, there's no right or wrong answer here. It's, it's just sort of um, something to kind of play around with. And, and one example that I, that I always use, which may or may not mean anything to, to everyone, but is if we had an H, if we were looking at HTML, um, we could have an HTML badge. So someone could earn a badge that said, I know HTML. And that's pretty high level. That's pretty not granular in that, um, you know, there's lots of stuff that makes up um, uh, the language, HTML language, or we could uh, we could issue badges for like I know the A tag, or I know you know the um, I know tags in general. But so we could get super super granular, which probably wouldn't be very helpful either, because um, you know if I have whatever if I have thousands of badges that represent each little thing within the HTML language that I know, that's not super helpful either. So there's got there's probably some sweet spot in the middle. Or, or somewhere on that kind of continuum that, that shows that I've, I've sort of been progressing and, and learning various things and I know various approaches um, within HTML, um, but, but also isn't you know, so granular that, that, that um, it's almost meaning, meaningless. Um, and then also how difficult are, are, are badges to achieve? And so obviously very rare badges, the harder that they are, probably implies value and that people might start valuing more. But again, this is another trade-off in that, of course, you want it at least to be accessible to um, to a certain amount of people, or just people with certain level of skills. So, so both of these are sort of a balance to sort of play around with, and, and many of the things I'm talking about are are that way as well. Um, levels. So, are there levels of badges? Are your badges hierarchical? Um, you know, are there badges that you need to in order to get access to other badges? So are there prerequisites? Um, do badges aggregate? You know, or do you get a set? Do you have to earn a set of badges, and then that sort of unlocks, if you will, like a, a, an aggregate badge? 
Um, and this, these kind of play into some of the considerations I was talking about before with the open badge infrastructure in that um, as you think about pushing your badges out of your system into this broader ecosystem, um, one of the considerations is like which badges to push. And, and some people might decide to push them all. But if you, if you have some prerequisite badges or you have some more granular badges that sort of build up to these higher level badges, maybe you only want to push the higher level badges. So there's, there's kind of this consideration of like what's actually going to be valuable for people outside of my learning environment or my system in a broader ecosystem. Um, you know, kind of what pathways are you, are you really trying to push people on and, and how, do, how do you want to um, encourage that uh, through, the, through your system as well as through the, through the OBI. Um, role and identity and opportunity. So um, again, there's lots of crossover before these, between these. I've, I've sort of alluded to this already, but the idea of like, um, you know, are there various roles or identities that, that these badges represent? Um, and, and that kind of, you know, goes back to maybe the aggregation or, or various levels. Like at some level, um, is, are they, you know, a ninja or, or a various role or identity? And, and, and does, does that role or identity unlock privileges or does that give them access to something or, or what, what do they get for being, um, for reaching that level? Um, one kind of important thing to think about, um, which can get kind of playful too, is sort of what narratives can people weave around badges? Um, you know, are you defining the narratives at, at the beginning? Like there are these, these types of roles and opportunities and this is what this means or, or is there a little bit of wiggle room there where people can, can sort of um, aggregate their own badges or pull them together and, and sort of weave narratives or, or um, identities around those badges. Um, uh, and then also, of course, what opportunities and privileges we talked about are un unlocked? Are there, are there various, do they get access to various things through these badges? Um, that kind of thing. Uh, performance and assessment, this is, a, this is another huge one. Um, this actually is another one that everyone will, will need to consider. Um, and again, as I mentioned before, some of the content you are working with might already have a lot of the assessments designed, um, and that's okay. Uh, but obviously, um, it's, it's just an important consideration. If it's not there in the content, it needs to be addressed um, in the proposal. Because again, we're, when we talk about badges here, we're talking about more than just an image um, or a, you know, sort of a symbol. We're talking about really the meat behind the badges um, that's both defined in the metadata for the OBI, but, but that metadata points to things like criteria and assessment so that we have evidence behind this badge and people can understand the badge. Um, so that, that is a, um, certainly a, a big piece of this. And again, when I go through the P2PU uh, badge system, I'll, I'll talk about um, our thoughts around that as well. Um, permanence, do the badges expire? And how would someone renew the badge? So, um, obviously, again, if, if these are skills that, um, you know, sort of are outdated over time, um, then, then those badges should probably expire. And, and what is the pathway or what are the opportunities that you're going to provide through the badge system for people to renew those badges? Um, maybe there's another assessment or refresher type of course or something that people, that people take. Um, portability and transparency. Um, so, again, this is sort of thinking about um, in the context of the OBI, as I was talking about before, you know, sort of what what are the badges that are valuable within your community, and and what are the what are those that are valuable outside of your community, and and maybe there maybe there's a lots of crossover, maybe they're one and the same, but but sort of being mindful of that and thinking about that, thinking about what your goals are for your badges. Are the goals actually for people to get jobs, or are they certain just to sort of level up within your own site? Um, and so, kind of thinking through the goals of, of each badge will sort of help you make some decisions around things that we've already talked about, like granularity and leveling and, um, and your interaction with the OBI. Protection, how can you protect against gaming? Um, you might decide to build something into the assessment process that, that sort of you know, requires there to be a little bit more rigor around, um, around badges. Um, one thing to note is that the, the Open Badge infrastructure um, helps here because there's actually an authentication channel so that um, someone couldn't just uh, cop, you know, copy an image of a badge and put it on their site. Um, because basically through the authentication channel, it allows you to call back through the badge and say, hey, issuer, did you in fact issue this badge to this person, and is it still valid? And so um, that there's, there's some sort of technical implementations that help protect um, the badges a little bit there as well. Um, endorsement, so um, uh, it, are there third parties that you would want to actually endorse your badges to add value? Um, so who might that be? What kind of criteria would they require? 
And again, this is another feature of the OBI that you can have people endorse your badges and, and store that information with those badges. So um, that's another thing to consider. The, the most obvious one, obviously, is design. What do your badges look like? Um, is there a visual theme? What is the branding? Um, is there consistency across the badges? Um, Team. Uh, so, um, you know, so what this this section of the the call for proposals is this is kind of moving out of the badge characteristics. This is actually a se separate section. But the idea is, um, you know, part of this competition is recognizing the fact that it takes a lot of different types of people to really do a really good job of building a, a high quality badge system. Um, again, th that's our, sort of our assumption. Um, and so part, the, one of the goals of the competition is to pull together the right types of people to sort of to create these high, high quality and successful badge systems. So, so this section of the call for proposals is really helping you think about what, um, what skills and, um, and competencies you already have in your team and, wh and where the gaps are. Because um, if, you're, if you're a winning proposal, then, then Haystack and, and MacArthur will help kind of fill that, those gaps um, where possible. And then the third part is technology. So again, what are, what's your vision for the system sort of behind the badges that will manage the assessments, that will issue the badges? Um, uh, that, you know, that is a very important piece. And, and again, some of the content out there already has some of those environments, and some of them, some of them don't at all. So there's um, a little bit of kind of a variation about how much this needs to go into this um, as well. So quickly, because um, I want to make sure we have uh, time for questions, I wanted to walk through again the PWU School Webcraft Badge Pilot to just kind of show the the um, the thinking that we went through about these various characteristics. Um, School Webcraft is a partnership between Mozilla and PWU that's focused on um, uh, allowing people to learn open technologies and web development skills through a peer-based um, learning environment on PWU. So when we were thinking about the badge system and thinking about content and skills, obviously web development was the domain that, um, that we wanted to work in. Um, but in terms of defining the skills, again, we, we felt it was incredibly important to have both hard skill and soft skill badges um, because web development is such a social discipline and because we know as Mozilla, as employers of web developers, that, um, that, that, that the softer skills are things that are really, really hard to know about people. It's one thing to to know that they know JavaScript or they know a specific language, but, but oftentimes it's the softer skills that, that really kind of help them fit into a team or even make them um, sort of very flexible to learn additional technologies once you bring them on board. So we felt it was uh, important to have both represented here. Um, scarcity or granularity, I sort of already talked about this, like, um, you know, what, what granularity should we do, should we have for these various badges? Um, we actually decided to, to stay pretty high level, so we had a JavaScript badge, PHP badge, um, and uh, and a little bit more abstracted away from some of the the more granular elements of those languages, um, mainly because we're starting with a small set of badges, and we also were pushing all of them into the open badge infrastructure. And so again, we felt that the most valuable were those kind of high level badges. So so again, that's another thing that um, in terms of your proposals, you may just say like we we have decided to go with these set of badges. Now we think in the future there might be some more granular badges that we can build in. Um, uh, but again, it's, it's, it's a sort of a, a something for you to play with as you think through this. Levels, we had basic and expert levels for the hard skill badges. So again, this is another oversimplification, but, but um, something that we just wanted to test out. So there are sort of very basic um, uh, foundational skills for JavaScript and PHP, um, and then there was the higher expert level that um, people could sort of work up to. And I think moving forward, we will have um, more levels in between, obviously. But, um, and we're also developing a webmaking 101 badge, which is um, uh, basically a badge that you, you would aggregate to. So once you earn sort of HTML, JavaScript, that kind of thing, you you sort of um, you aggregate and uh, you can aggregate those to get this webmaking 101 badge. Um, roles and identity, um, we had basic and expert again, um, uh, which sort of sort of started to set kind of reputation and roles within the community. Um, we had what we call gurus, which were people that had earned expert level badges and, and were doing a lot of the assessment of expert level badges. Um, and so we had a lot of reports of people using those to find mentors um, and sort of help understand their, their position within the, the community. Um, performance and assessment, uh, we really looked at this as an opportunity to um, be very innovative with assessment and, and really design assessments that reflect the learning that was already happening. So 
um, you know, making sure that the assessments were authentic, um, so they were all challenge-based, um, that people could, um, you know, use existing work if they, if they already had and that there wasn't kind of like extra um, artificial work that they had to do for the assessments. We also really relied on peer assessment a lot um, because, again, this is a peer learning environment, so we felt it was very important to um, bring peers into the assessment process. Um, uh, and so we, we have kind of various approaches for that. Um, again, guru assessment was, was another model of somebody that had already earned the badge, so peers, still your peers, but if you would already earned the badge and sort of shown that you're a certain level, then, then you had access to assess um, other expert level things. So we sort of played around with the concept of peer assessment and the badges um, as well. Um, permanence, thought a lot about this. Obviously, the hard skill badges um, should expire. Uh, we, d we, we were able to sort of hand wave on this because um, this was a pilot that we had a start and a finish. Um, and so these are kind of, we've, we've rolled these out as like alpha badges so people can, you know, be proud that they have the alpha badges, but, but they're very clearly part of, of a pilot. Um, and so, uh, so we didn't really have to figure out assess, uh, expiration, but, but that is something that we're, that we're working with right now. Um, portability, transparency, uh, the badges, when you earn them in P2P, they automatically showed up on your um, profile within PDPU, but then um, then those badges also were pushed into the open badge infrastructure again to get um, more value outside of, of the community. So um, the idea is again that they're pushed in the open badge infrastructure and um, combined with badges from other systems and then shared out through various audiences based on um, based on sort of what the learner feels is valuable where. Protection uh, again, I mentioned this briefly, but we had um, we built some stuff into the assessment, so uh, you needed actually to be peer assessed by three at least three peers. You needed three yes votes, if you will, based on the assessment to earn a badge. So it wasn't as easy as me just getting my friend to just say yes um, or to vote up my um, my assessment. That you needed uh, it, we needed sort of more people involved. Also, all the assessments had to have. Um, kind of comments and justifications with them, so it was not as easy to just sort of click a button and move on, that, that there was a little bit more built into that assessment to help protect, um, uh, add, uh, sort of, uh, sorry, avoid gaming. Um, endorsement, uh, Mozilla obviously endorsed these badges, um, but, but there's ideas that we have for moving forward for like MIT Open Courseware or other types of, um, of uh, organizations that that are big in kind of technology and web development that, that would actually add value to have them um, sort of endorsing our badges and assessments. So design, obviously we have both the Mozilla brand and the PDPU brand. Um, excuse me, uh, the, the Mozilla brand, we decided to only include the Mozilla brand on the hard skill badges because those were most sort of aligned with a lot of um, what people think of with Mozilla and sort of web technology, um, but then put the PDPU brand um, and Mozilla ran on the sort of softer skills. So there's kind of things to play around with there. We, we played around with like the gear shape, although some people say it looks like a Reese's Pieces cup, so I don't know if that's very effective, but the idea was a gear shape for harder skills, um, uh, sort of iconography for um, the softer skills, that kind of thing. So definitely things to play around with there. Um, team, so it wasn't a one-person job. Uh, I don't really need to spend a lot of time here, but just you can glance here and see that there are lots of people that were involved in, in sort of pulling this, um, this badge system together. And so again, um, there's definitely recognition that for your badge systems that, that there, there will sort of need to be a team behind this and um, where we can fill in gaps, we will. Um, technology, so P2PU has a learning platform but actually did not have the capacity for um, managing the assessments and the, and the badges. And so. Um, for this pilot, we actually had to um, create our, a, a new um, environment for them. And uh, we actually used an open source um, product, product called OSQA that we basically uh, customized to manage the peer assessment and the, the rating and the voting of the, of the work as well as the, the badge issuing. So again, this is an example of something that you might, um, you might allude to in your proposal or you might, um, ideas that you might have around how to support this stuff for your proposal. So that's really it. So sorry, I started talking faster at the end because I definitely want to make sure that, um, that we have lots of time uh, for questions. And I see that David has joined us. So, um, so I am going to stop talking now. And uh, as we know, stage two is open now. And, um, and proposals are due in January. Could I just jump in, Hyde? Yes, please um, do. Aaron, could I, could, could I just jump in? Uh, you, you have the old due date of 12th January. 
Oh. We've actually extended the date to the 17th of January to uh, both give people a bit more time in the wake of the holidays and then also uh, we're looking to hold another webinar uh, sometime in that uh, after New Year period uh, and to give us time to put that together. Great. It is now updated on the fly. Great. I see that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Cheryl here. Thanks, David. Thanks, Aaron. And um, yes, I'm glad, David, that you mentioned the deadline is January 17th, 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. I also wanted to say to people that um, please follow the blog on dmlcompetition.net. I think as people get into the holidays, as developers and programmers start to ask questions and have some more technical things that they might want to talk about, um, we're going to look for a good social Q&A site where we can make it easy for people to have those kinds of conversations. So I'll be posting that information in this next week. So watch watch the blog feed for that. Uh, I think the first thing that we should do is jump into a question that, David, I think will be a good one for you. Um, this has to do, for, especially for those of you who have stage one, stage two type of matchmaking questions. Can you talk a little bit about the matchmaking process and whether or not stage one winners are guaranteed to be matched with the stage two winner and the opportunity to mutually approve a pairing, those kinds of questions? Yeah, sure. Um, so this, of course, is uh, slightly sticky. I mean, we, we're trying to do right by everybody over here. I think the first thing to say is that um, the strongest uh, probability you would have of being matched with somebody uh, you would like to work with is to encourage them to apply uh, and uh, you know to to work up front with them about uh, what a really scintillating um, set of badges or badge system would look like from your point of view. Uh, we can't guarantee, uh, of course, that they would win. There's a rigorous judging uh, process, uh, and we cannot, unfortunately, guarantee that you absolutely will be matched uh, with, with anyone. Uh, that will depend on uh, the proposals we get, uh, on the value of the proposals, on um, the excellence of the badges, the badge systems uh, they produce. Um, and uh, we also will not force uh, any um, marriage <laughs> to take place, no forced marriages here. Um, we will give you an option uh, if we think uh, that such an option uh, looks available um, for you to uh, be partnered or paired with somebody um, that we think might be a good fit uh, and you'd have a, a right of refusal. Uh, but uh, obviously if you refuse the pairing that we propose or suggest, uh, we cannot guarantee a pairing after that. David? Yeah. Thanks, David. We have another question to hear that says, if I applied in stage one but did not advance, can I still apply in stage two? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, you obviously are not uh, applying so much for the learning content that failed to advance. I mean, you're now applying for the um, uh, on the badge design side, um, you know, in a way you have to think of these if at these stages if relatedly also as discrete. Uh, so what we're looking for in stage two are um, you know effective and excellent badge designs and badge design systems, badge systems. Um, you know we're uh, using learning content as a way of uh, exemplifying what the badges will be for, and the badge system will represent. Uh, but effectively what we're looking for in stage two are, you know, is the badge design itself, it's not the learning content. So you can't, in a sense, sneak the learning content in, in the back door if it didn't pass muster in stage four. Okay, so most of the next questions are, are technical based, and David and Aaron, if you want to decide between yourselves if there are questions that you want to add to, I'll, I'll, let, you, I'll let you figure that out. The, the first one is how technical should we be in our stage two proposals? For example, at the software systems level, will the reviewers be looking for concrete resolutions to technical problems such as our system offers a web API based on RESTful web 
the services running on an Amazon AWS cloud-based auto load balancing Rails 3.1 server. <laughs> <laughs> I can take that. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, so yes, that was incredibly impressive. Uh, I, I think there is no expectation of that level of technical detail um, at this level or for the stage two proposal. Um, we basically want to see um, that that you have you consider the technical side and that you have various ideas around about how those components would work and that sort of all the bases are covered. Um, but but yeah, the getting down to the nitty gritty is um, is not. Um, expected, and um, I'm, I'm sure that actually a lot of the judges won't even speak that language. Um, from the Mozilla side, I mean, certainly we, again, want to see that you're thinking about the open badge infrastructure and, and sort of um, kind of how that, how you would interact with us from, from the sort of higher level of like what badges do you think you would push, what is the value that you would be offering. Um, and uh, we might be able to speak the technical, speak a little bit more, but again, it's not, that, that is not really, um, expected or, or incredibly needed at this level. Thank you. The next question, another fairly long one, I'll read it out. Should we spend most of our 1,500 words describing only the structure and interaction between higher level systems within the badge architecture or invest further in an in-depth description of relevant data structures and algorithms? So for example, is it sufficient to say that the teaching badge authorizes a user to issue level one knowledge badges, or should we also specify the relevant parts of the hierarchical permission inherited data structure and algorithm that make it so? Definitely uh, focus more on, on sort of the badge relationship at, for stage two. So, so in that last example, um, you know, talking about the, the teacher one badges and, and sort of their relation to other badges and sort of how those are assessed or what's the criteria is, is much more kind of important for de demonstrating the badge system idea than, again, the, the, sort of the nitty gritty kind of um, technical permissioning behind it. Obviously, it's great that, that you're thinking through that and I think you can, you can sort of mention that you're thinking through that and even have attachments that show, that show those ideas. But, but I think given that you, you do have 1,500 word um, constraints, obviously as much as, as, much of, um, as much as you can use that to express your ideas around the actual badges and, and the sort of system supporting those badges um, from a higher level would, would be valuable. It would be the best about it. Okay, and the next question, a nice simple one. What are you expecting to see in supplementary materials? Well, so uh, I'll let David weigh in on this as well. But um, so I think uh, if you if you could include things like badge designs um, or uh, you know any kind of sort of diagrams or thoughts about the hierarchy of badges or even the technical aspects that you're thinking of, um, anything that sort of again supplements the, the the sort of basic description of the badges and and kind of shows um, a little bit more uh, explains a little bit more about the system behind the badges um, would would certainly um, add value. Um, I don't know, David, if you have some other things that you were thinking yeah, as well. I, um, I, I, you know, I agree with that. Uh, I, see. Um, I, I think one wants to be careful of you know, adding huge layers of material as supplements. Um, you know, judges tend to look principally at the uh, body of the proposal. Uh, and if they're piqued by certain questions or have their interests sort of jarred by wanting to know uh, more about this or that, uh, they'll, they'll look a bit more in, in depth at the supplementary material as illustrations of what it is you're trying to get at. So I, I would choose carefully about what you add to the supplement. Okay, thank you both. The next question is, are the specifications that are available at openbadges.org the final set of specs, or do you expect or allow for changes in the future? That's a great question. So those, um, those are not finalized. Uh, I think, I mean, the way that Mozilla works anyway is that everything sort of um, is, evolves and, um, and grows with, with kind of community involvement anyway. So, um, but, but we are in beta right now, and, um, and by the time these badge systems are developed, so as people start to develop through 
2012, we will be um, at a, in a 1.0 or a, a sort of GA generally available um, version. So, so that's when a lot more of the specifications will, um, will be a little bit more locked down. But it, that said, I mean, I think we've, we've done a lot of thinking. We've worked with a lot of people um, on the, the actual badge manifest or metadata spec that I talked about. Um, and so that is the most kind of core set um, that, that have, have been agreed upon on this kind of wider community that we've been working with. So that we do feel pretty good about that. Um, uh, what might change moving forward is, is based on these kinds of badge systems that emerge and, and, and sort of ideas that everybody has, there might be kind of additional um, kind of extensibility types of um, fields that we add to allow people to do more with it. But, um, but we, we do feel that we've got kind of a core set that, that we're moving forward with moving, um, moving forward. But in terms of how you're going to plug in and, and all of that specific, um, that will all be locked down before, um, before you uh, actually get to the point where you're building that. Okay, and another tech question. Can you share the name of the open source software you used for managing the tech platform again? Yes, so for, I think probably you're referencing the peer-to-peer the -peer university um, badge pilot, and that was, is an open source product called um, OSQA. Uh, I think it's open source question and answering is what it stands for. So it's essentially a Stack Overflow clone um, that, that is um, actually open source. Um, and another thing to note on that is that I think P2PU is working um, to also release the system that they developed, which is essentially the OSQA with some customizations around the, uh, the peer assessment and badges. Um, so that, that is also something that, that could be available moving forward. And Erin, maybe you can tell us the name of the OS, the operating system um, that P2PU is using for its pilot peer assessment. Uh, so that, that is it. It's, um, it's called OSQA. Um, I think that's the question. So basically OSQA is, that, is, um, is a uh, open source product that is kind of uh, manages uh, questions and answers and voting up and down of those questions and answers as well as kind of this um, sort of data logic that issues badges behind that. So that's available I think at osqa.org. Um, I can look that up right now but um, and that's uh, freely downloadable, and once you download it, um, no, it's not osqa.org. Uh, you can customize it. osqa.net. Okay, thank you, Erin. We're going to go back to a couple of process questions, and this one is a, a long one, so I'll read it out. If we applied and advanced in stage one, can we align our stage two cross proposal to our specific stage one content? Is it possible to be matched with ourselves if we are open to be ma matching? If we are open to be matched with ourselves, but would also like to be considered for other stage one winning content that is not our own, how should we address that in the proposal? David, do you want to address that one, or would you like me to read that again to make it a little bit more clear? Yeah, could you? So I'm going to break it into two parts. Um, if we applied and advanced in stage one, can we align our stage two proposal to our specific stage one content? Is yes, it possible indeed. to be matched with ourselves? Okay, good. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the second, and the second part is a slight variation. If we are open to being matched with ourselves, but would also like to be considered for other stage one winning content that is not our own, how should we address that in the proposal? Uh, I, I think if you just uh, indicate uh, those things very briefly, uh, that will be fine. I mean, it, there's a sense in which it will almost be automatic that that's done. Um, but, you know, given uh, indicating your openness to uh, pursuing both path pathways, I think, would be um, ideal. Okay. Um, here's a follow-up question. Uh, maybe I, actually, I think maybe um, this is this probably is coming out of out of step here. So I'm going to actually move on to we got, we have a research question. Um, David, you might be able to help with this. This person saw that there are there is a research competition. Uh, in addition to the research competition winners, is there a core group of researchers who look at this project and what issues they are addressing? Is there a research agenda for this badges competition? Uh, yeah, that's a really interesting question. We've had some discussion uh, of that, uh, and 
we would obviously be very interested to see a proposal to the research or set of proposals to the research competition that proposes just that. There, there uh, very likely will be funding. I, I can't say uh, in, in addition to the funding already available. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm not at liberty to say for sure for the next few days, uh, but there will very likely be some funding um, a, a, available uh, that uh, will do uh, that will call for just that. So uh, I need to um, promote research, a research agenda, or research proposal uh, to which there would be some assigned funding uh, that follows the. Um, effectivity of the competition in surfacing and enabling uh, the use of badges uh, for recognizing and rewarding uh, learning. So, great question. Okay, and this question may be, I may have some background for this that I could add to it. The question is, are there plans for using badges with kids? Are there special considerations that should be made when designing a badge system for minor audiences. I know from watching some of my Google groups and listservs that there, there are concerns about using email identifiers with the Open Badge infrastructure. Erin, maybe you want to comment on that. I think some schools have issues about using email with the system. Sure. Yep. Sure. So um, what Cheryl's referencing is the Open Badge infrastructure is built around um, Mozilla identity work. So there's a sort of top level project at Mozilla to um, sort of think through um, how you can have an open identity that follows you around on the web. And so that's called browser ID, the, the current iteration, and, and that is based on email address. And so, so the Open Badge infrastructure leverages that, um, that solution and therefore the identifier within open, the infrastructure is email address. So somebody, the, all of someone's badges are tied to an email address. So um, that uh, is a concern for um, you know minors in that minors actually probably don't have an email address or, or don't have a permanent email address. Um, the the thing about so minors is sort of a, a, a broader issue um, uh, in terms of the open badge infrastructure. You can absolutely design badges for um, for minors, and in fact that's highly encouraged. And you can manage that through through your website. So so minors can come to your website. You can sort of handle. Um, identity and, and authentication, however that you want to handle it there. You can issue them badges, you can even show those on their profiles there, and that can all work within your website. Um, where there's you know, potential issues is, is when you want to then push those badges into the Open Badge infrastructure, um, and that's, that, those, some of those issues are sort of well beyond um, the technical decisions that we've made. Um, there's there's you know, privacy concerns around things like FERPA and, Co and COPPA, that basically say that um, you know that kids under 13 can't actually um, decide who, where, and who to share information with on, online. And so, so when you come up against kind of issues like that, there's there's not a lot that we can do. Um, but but I think it's a workable solution in that again, you can still issue badges on your site and manage them there. Um, and there's actually not an, an incredible amount of value for kids under 13 um, pushing badges into that bigger e ecosystem because again. They, they actually, according to the law, can't really decide to share those badges with anyone. So, so they're, they're not sort of getting that opportunity to then share them and, and earn sort of jobs or, or whatever the, the end result is. So, so the, the sort of recommendation that we have at this point is, is definitely go ahead and design badges and issue them for, for minors within your site, um, but, but don't push the badges for kids 13 and under into the open badge infrastructure. Once they're 13 and above, you can you can definitely push those in, and, and there's less concerns around privacy. There's still some concerns around you know 13 to 18 with email address, and that is something that um, this, we're sort of working very closely with our advisory group to kind of come to see how we might how we might work with that. So again, if if, um, if there are solutions that we that we can come to, um, that would be in place by the time that any of these batches to be developed. Okay, thank you, Erin. Um, David, we have another process question. This one says, um, "There's you have mentioned there's no pair, forced pairings. If we say no to the suggested pairing, what does that mean for the applicants standing in the competition? Well, as I say, I mean, you know, A, we can't guarantee any pairing at all. Uh, it depends on the sorts of proposals we get. Uh, B, if we propose a pairing, 
um, you know, in, in all good faith, uh, and it's turned down for whatever reason. Uh, you know, I don't want to say you go to the back of the, <laughs> you know, the, the end of the, the end of the line and start all over, but it, you know, obviously the, the odds go down because it would depend on the availability of even another, uh, you know, relevant uh, possible pairing uh, to suggest. Uh, uh, to you in this case, so uh, you know uh, there are just so many shots we can we can say there'll be um, at, at getting a chance to move forward. But we'll do our best. I mean, obviously we're we're as keen to, you know, if if they're stage one winners and uh, we we'd like to see you move forward uh, with an effective badge design system coming out of stage two. I mean, that's the purpose of it. Okay, thank you, David. Um, we have one more question, and um, this may be a question you, you both want to comment on. Uh, the question is, it could be hard to predict how people gain badges. What should we be thinking about in order to offset the potential for gaming? What are examples of gaming the system that you could use as examples? And could you speak more about gaming and, and the idea of trying to stop it? Sure, I can start. Um, so I think you're totally right that um, that it is it is hard to predict um, you know sort of how uh, how these will be valued and how they will be gamed um, and obviously the more the more that they're valued um, the the more that there's the potential that that people will will try to game the system um, and some of that is also tied to sort of how successful we are in building this ecosystem obviously if there is a strong ecosystem and people are using the badges and value, valuing them on the other end um, again then there there is more kind of value built up in each badge and, and sort of more potential there. So, so some of that, yes, is, is sort of something that we will have to work through as we move forward. But what we're kind of looking for here is, um, is just kind of considerations around um, sort of basic protection and gaming. And so one example is um, if you have um, badges that peers can award to each other, right? So there's, there's definitely um, uh, the potential there where I might just have um, and you might just be my friend, and so I give it to you, and you give it to me. Um, or with the peer assessment, obviously, um, if you're if you're relying on peers to assess each other, um, I could just go get my friend to say, "Yep, that's that's a um, that that looks you know, they have that skill, give them that badge," and, and then I might reciprocate. And actually, you see that like on LinkedIn recommendations, they you know you'll somebody will recommend someone, and then and then turn around and they'll recommend you right back. Um, and so some considerations that we built in the P2PU um, system were with peer assessment, like I said, um, it's not enough to just have one peer um, rate your assessment or rate your work, but you need at least three that are giving you a positive assessment. Um, and those assessments must include criteria and sort of a little bit more um, kind of um, thought process around their vote. Uh, so again, it doesn't mean it's, it's, um, that it's gaming proof, uh, but it certainly is adding another layer uh, to kind of force people to, to be sort of, um, uh, to, to really kind of think through this and, and be kind of true to it. Um, uh, with the other example of peer-to-peer -peer -peer badges where someone's giving you the badge, we actually allowed peers to give each other badges, but, but actually had them accumulate. So um, a peer, I could only give you a badge one time, um, but, but you could earn them from a bunch of other uh, peers. So you might have the good communicator times five, and that actually tells a lot more than if you just have it from one person. So again, they're they're really subtle ideas and thoughts, but but just kind of building in a little bit more um, sort of process around um, around what it takes to earn the badges to then um, to to sort of avoid some of that low level gaming if possible. I would just add that the you know the the, the more you're a, uh, you know obviously anybody looking uh, at the badges that are offered. Uh, and looking at the way in which they're offered uh, will determine the um, you know the value of the uh, that the badge represents, right? So uh, you know the more one is able to um, indicate openly and clearly uh, that uh, you know just uh, turning around and relying on your friends to uh, scratch your back as you scratch their backs. Um, you know, the, the more one is able to sort of uh, indicate, show that uh, one has a more thoughtful process in the way Aaron indicated underlying this, uh, uh, you know, the more convincing uh, the badge system will be. 
Well, um, thank you both. I I said that this was going to be our last question, but we got a really good one in, and, and sometimes with the leftover questions, we save them for the next webinar, but this is a good one for right now. So if you don't mind, I'm, I'm going to ask it. Um, I apologize to everybody for going a little bit over. The question is, is there anything that stage one winners can do that would help potential badge creators get excited about or better understand our technical needs? Sorry, can you repeat that one more time really quickly? The question is, is there anything that stage one winners can do that would help potential badge creators get excited about or better understand our or their technical needs? So is there something in the, the process of designing a badge system that might help the stage one winners drum up support and, and have people get excited? Is there, is there any kind of blueprint or anything we can point them to um, and this, this might, the, the thing that we're planning on doing on dmlcompetition.net is to try and help people find places where they can have conversations at sort of the more technical level. And, um, and maybe that's what, what this question is getting at. I know, Aaron, there's a place on GitHub where, where programmers and developers can actually look at the code if, if that's what, if that's the level of detail that people want. But Aaron, if you have any other suggestions, you may want to speak to this as well. No, I think that's right. I mean, I, I think if, um, you know, if they're asking about if, if stage one winners are, are trying to convey more information to stage two designers, um, I think uh, basically the way that the competition is set up is, you know, the, the, the content sort of ex from stage one exists as it is now, and, and stage two is sort of working with that content, but the whole point of stage three is to really give both stage one and stage two um, the match matched up uh, groups time or teams, I guess, time to really um, to work through and iterate on on their on their badge system. So if that's kind of what the question is is aimed at. Then then that's the point of stage three is to really um, is to really work through that in terms of examples and things to really um, in, sort of inspire stage two designers. Um, just some of that, yes, we'll provide on DML um, the competition website. Um, some of that um, will be on the Open Badges website. There are some kind of widgets that are being developed for various technologies around badges that, that will be up there over the next month or so. Um, so yeah, I, I would say that those are the best resources. Um, and again, you don't have to have all the technical details worked out um, for the stage, for the January 17th deadline. It's just more. Yeah, I, I mean, it's an interesting question in the sense of, you know, what, um, I mean, in a way, if I can paraphrase, uh, you know, the, the question is asking uh, what can be done to draw attention to my particular proposal uh, in such a way that designers would go, oh, that's interesting, uh, let me see if we can uh, design a badging system uh, for that set of content. Um, you know, in part, that you, you know, the, the, the fact that you won stage one meant that judges looking independently at this um, have their interest piqued by, by what you put in your proposal. So that's, of course, encouraging. We did send out, uh, when we um, um, announced you as a winner, I mean, we, we sent a note to you uh, asking for a, a set of brief tags. Uh, so, you know, you should have given some thought to, uh, to how you wanted your proposal tagged in a way that would draw attention to uh, your proposal. Uh, you know, the only other thing that one can add is uh, you know, if you have a way of drumming up um, uh, potential badge designers to be interested in your material, then you should certainly be doing this stage. Great. Thank you so much, David and Aaron. That was really helpful. I, I hope everybody got their questions answered. If you have any follow-up or clarification, you can always write to dml at uci.hri.edu, the contact box that's located on dmlcompetition.net. And I want to thank um, everybody for joining us. We will be in touch probably through the blog about um, archiving this webinar and any upcoming events that we can offer to help people with their application process. Thanks, everybody. And thank you, Cheryl.